I am Rev. Brianne Swan, and this is Sermons from the East End for Sunday, September 24, 2023. It is Earth Sunday in the season of creation, and we also honor the upcoming National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Isaiah, Amos, Jeremiah, Micah, Ezekiel. These are some of the prophets we read about in the Hebrew Bible. To say they had a difficult job would be an understatement. Their role was to bring news of God's displeasure with the people's wrongdoing, the consequences for these transgressions, and also the promise of reconciliation that would one day come. They often brought news from God in the form of oracles, direct communications from God through the prophet in the form of sacred verse. As you can imagine, prophets were rarely popular often living on the fringes of their respective societies. Speaking truth to power has had violent consequences ever since time began. They confronted kings, queens, and the established religious leadership with unpopular truths. They were shunned and ridiculed. Canada is currently being confronted with some of its own unpopular truths, one of which is a long history of violence towards Indigenous peoples. Entering into treaties the Crown never intended to honour. Forced relocation of entire communities to isolated reserves. Stealing children and sending them away to residential schools. The 60s scoop. Contaminated drinking water, murdered and missing Indigenous women. This tragic list goes on and on. And so what would a prophet in the tradition of the Hebrew Scriptures say to the political and religious leadership of Canada today? This is an oracle concerning Canada. O Canada, your myth is built upon an illusion of peace, yet your temples rest upon graveyards where tombstones are etched by lies. Remember with anguish the landing of your ancestors, claiming territory not of their birthright, seeing only emptiness where they had not yet disturbed. With ink to paper and finger to nose, promises were made to your maltreated host and accepted under duress and false pretense. Yet still you despised your covenants, stitching with threads of contempt, tailoring treaties to suit your body alone. Listen, tears of despair flood the night. Young ones bawling for their mothers, women keening for their babies. You snatch children like chattel until entire villages mourn. Silence, the reminder youth no longer lives among them. And yet generation piled on generation you sit, nodding your head in silent accord, convinced as you are by the false prophets, unaware of the violence hanging contemptuously from your tongue. You claim the Lord's will, though it is not known to you. You judge craving and sloth, though it is of your own making. The Lord is mighty and strong, and you will deny justice no more. Like fires engulfing the dry northern lands, the wrath of the Lord will ultimately consume. And you will cry and cry and cry, the pain too much for your malnourished bones. Repentance can only lead to hearts breaking open. What begins in the heart ultimately engulfs the soul's entirety. (laughs) 
Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16 from the New Revised Standard Version Updated Edition. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and at about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and ending with the first. When those hired around five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the sun and the scorching heat? But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? And so the last will be first, and the first will be last. So it is Earth Sunday in the season of creation. And we are also acknowledging the upcoming National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. And we will talk about all of that. But the first thing I want to tell you is a little bit about my family's summer vacation. Every other year, my husband and my two kids and I pile into the car with a cooler full of snacks and a bunch of audiobooks and make the long trek out to Saskatchewan and Alberta to see Jason's family. Now, if any of you have made that drive to Western Canada before from Toronto, you will know that the longest stretch is just getting out of Ontario. And don't get me wrong, Northern Ontario is stunningly beautiful. But it is a long trip, especially with two kids. And this year, the trip out of Ontario was even just a little bit longer because we decided to go on a bit of a pilgrimage to visit the birthplace of one of our favorite artists. Norval Morisot. Morisot, or Copper Thunderbird, a name given to him in his late teens, and the name with which he signed all of his art, was an indigenous artist from Bingley, Neyashi, and Nishnebek First Nation. Even if you don't recognize his name, I am almost certain you will recognize his art. He is the founder of the Woodland School, and his pieces can be seen all across Canada and throughout the world. Morisot was born within what was then known as Sandpoint First Nation, a community on the shores of Lake Nipigon. This is where my family and I made our pilgrimage. When we arrived at BNA First Nation, we were very graciously given a full tour and significant history of the community. The people of Bingwe, Neashi, and Nishnebek First Nation have occupied the southeast shores of Lake Nipigon for time immemorial. However, in the early 20th century, the Hydroelectric Power Commission of Ontario flooded Sandpoint and all First Nations communities around Lake Nipigon when they dammed the Nipigon River. Many families had no choice but to relocate. Then in the 40s and 50s, the Ontario government started to create provincial parks. It was part of a movement both within Canada and in the United States, the idea that in order to preserve nature, all of the humans needed to be removed, except for in very specific and controlled ways. 
And so while the Ontario government was supposed to return the area around Lake Nipigon to the federal government, they instead turned lands that encompassed Sandpoint into Black Sand Provincial Park. They cancelled the license of occupation that allowed the people of Sandpoint to reside on their own lands. Park rangers came and burned what remained of the community's buildings to the ground. The new provincial park became a place where people, almost entirely white people, could come to camp and bask on supposedly undisturbed land, pristine water, and earth. But thinking back to a few words that we heard earlier from that oracle, I can't help but think how that land must have cried and cried and cried. This Sunday, in the season of creation, we honor the earth. I believe very deeply that the earth holds memory. When I was living in Germany, I took a trip to visit the Ravensbrück concentration camp. You can feel it when you walk onto the soil, an overwhelming sense of something evil has happened here. The earth is still weeping. As I was looking at the charred remains of the schoolhouse, watching my children run around and playing, knowing I have never ever had to worry that the government would come and take them away, and knowing that the government would never ever have dammed the river next to my childhood farm and flood it so that other communities would have power, and then feeling my feet walking along the rocky soil, there was that feeling. The earth holds it all. The drive to create the national and provincial park systems came from the desire, again from people who had never actually lived on the land or with the land, to conserve the land, to protect the earth from human interference for generations to come. But many of these park systems came at a terrible cost. Entire peoples displaced from lands they'd lived on for thousands of years. Infrastructure built during the Second World War from the forced labor of interned Japanese Canadians, conscientious objectors, and German prisoners of war. And the reason the powers that be felt the earth needed to be protected was because the only concept those in power had for how people could relate to the earth were colonial examples anchored within resource extraction and exploitation. Historically, governments have prevented marginalized populations from being self-sufficient by controlling access to land. We see this play out in the dishonoring of treaties with indigenous peoples. We also have seen this play out in the prevention of black foragers from sustainably gleaning from the land. And so those who were living in spaces designated for parks were forced to flee in order to make space for tourists. The politics of movement and place are very real. They were real in Jesus' time, they were real before Jesus' time, and they are very real now. We hear in Matthew, For the kingdom of God is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. I really love parables, mostly because I really love a good story. But also because there are many different ways in which to read them. This, of course, can lead to a lot of conflict if one approaches a parable thinking there is only one true way to understand it. But there's also a lot of wisdom found in sitting within the liminal spaces that exist between different understandings. The landowner goes out to find laborers to work in his field. He goes out at 9 a.m., and then again at 12, and then again at 3, and then again at 5. And at the end of the day, the laborers line up to receive their pay, and everybody gets the same wage regardless of how long they have worked. And there are all kinds of really great questions here about why nobody was hiring the laborers who were still out there at 5 o'clock. Given what I've been talking about over the past ten minutes, I also have a wondering about how the landowner came to own that land in the first place. 
We don't know. What we do know is that those who have been working since 9 a.m. are upset. They've worked longer, so it just stands to reason that they'd receive more. That's just the way the world works, right? One of the many things colonialism has attempted to steal is the incredible, radical nature of Jesus' ministry. Not because he's offering a completely new perspective, but because he is challenging the assumptions of the current establishment's status quo, often with the ancient wisdom brought to the people by prophets long before his time. Caring for the poor, the need for just economic systems, God's favor extending beyond only those who look like us and sound like us. Jesus didn't come up with this stuff. They can be found before in the words from the ancestors of Jesus' faith, prophets who often lived on the margins of society. We often think of the Hebrew prophets with images of fire and brimstone and wrath. Certainly there is anger, but there is also lament, grief, and hope. The prophets, they are ultimately messengers of hope for a people who seek to live in relationship with God. Eventually, the oracles God speaks through prophets get to a place of hope. It doesn't need to be like this, God says. You are wounded through this too. There needs to be change. Those moments of metanoia that we often talk about as repentance, changes of heart leading to changes of action. It doesn't need to be like this. In fact, God through the prophets is pretty clear. It won't always be like this. It can't always be like this. We may need to get through the point where we cry and cry and cry. But a change is going to come one way or another. And in the reading we heard today, which was not written by a Hebrew prophet, but by me, sitting at my computer four years ago on the eve of the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, thinking about what the Hebrew prophets would say to this country in this time, there is much to cry and cry and cry about. But that is the inevitable result of hearts breaking open and moving through the process of metanoia. I want to go back to Norval Morisot and his art. Yesterday I shared, with the permission of Morisot's estate, a piece of art which I will link to in the show notes. It is called Androgyny. It was gifted by Morisot to the Canadian people in 1983 as a decolonizing act of reconciliation. It was a gift. In Anishinaabek tradition, gifts are often given to forge connection, to honor, or to ask for assistance. Jamie Isaac, the Winnipeg Art Gallery's curator of Indigenous and Contemporary Art, describes androgyny as layered with meaning, which, side note, also sounds a bit like a parable to me. Morisot was talking about the balance of the four realms of earth water, sky, and underworld. Androgyny illustrates a world in balance and its cyclical nature. It addresses issues like gender equality, non-binary gender identity, environmental concerns, climate change, and notions of reconciliation between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. All too often we place these issues of justice within their own silos but they are entirely connected. How we relate to the earth and how we understand ourselves and our neighbors and what is considered art, these are all enmeshed. I was fortunate to have an email exchange over the weekend with Corey Dingle, who manages Norval Morisot's estate. 
he passed on the following paragraph written by a friend and champion of Morisot's work. And the only reason I am not naming him is because I am not sure he wishes to be named. But these are his words that I believe are incredibly important to hear. He says, What happens when art is part of the victimization and marginalization of particular groups, and in the Canadian reality of what happened to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit? Art is an expression by an individual of a reality they have experienced. It is specific as to time, place, and culture. Yet when it is great art, it tells something about the universal human experience. It breaks down the barriers that allow one group to exclude, marginalize, and victimize another. Usually, one of the ongoing ways communities and groups have been set up for effective marginalization and unjust treatment is to trivialize their art forms by transforming them into crafts a term that unfairly has been viewed as just a technique that is ordinary and also has no individual creativity and right to control. As one would have through concepts of copyright and fair compensation for its value. In addition, parts expropriated receive no credit. It also allows for the subtle message that the culture in question is from a dead culture that no longer exists. Morisot is an example of all that, and also an example of how one can nonetheless try to overcome those efforts to trivialize, depersonalize, and vilify the art. He survived residential schools. He survived the trauma he carried and that manifested in substance abuse. He survived the results of economic marginalization. He took the particulars of his experiences, the legacy he inherited from his grandfather and his First Nations culture, and essentially worked with a vocabulary to create new expressions that were rooted but went beyond their origins and emphatically said, those roots are part of a living tree, not a distant historical past. I think he can express so much as part of an expression of the protection of human rights through the respectful protection of artistic integrity and dignity. Indeed, Morisot did not come from a dead culture or a people who no longer exist. In 2010, Bingui Neyashi Anishinaabek First Nation received an order from the Government of Canada returning what was by then known as Lake Nipigon Provincial Park to Sandpoint First Nation. Since then, BNA First Nation has been working to create a green, sustainable, and accessible community with the hope that more and more BNA members will return to the land. When I asked how many families they hoped would return, the reply was all of them. Homes have been built and continue to be built. Over a dozen homes are currently occupied with many more members returning seasonally in temporary shelters. There are economic opportunities being developed, in particular with a state-of-the-art sawmill right in the community. The people are coming back to their land. And I wonder if the land also cries and cries and cries in the joy of their return. Now just to be very clear, I am not calling this a gift. It is not a gift when you give something back that was never yours to take in the first place. However, what Jesus offers in today's parable is the notion that everything the disciples knew to be true would be upended. All the assumptions about how we've come to understand how to function and relate within the world need to be challenged. Reconciliation is not just feeling bad that terrible things have happened. There is a difference between lament and guilt. Lament is important. It acknowledges that a terrible wrong has occurred. But guilt is paralyzing. Perhaps it's unavoidable, but ultimately it is not very productive. It doesn't make space or motivate us toward change. Reconciliation is hard 
and slow work. Because like Jesus challenging the disciples with this parable, with ideas that go against everything they've been taught is true, there are going to be many moments in this quest towards reconciliation and decolonizing our understanding of who we are as humans and how we can relate to one another that go against everything the dominant North Atlantic culture takes for granted and claims as truth. Everything from concepts about economic fairness, to our understanding of gender and sexuality, to our relationship and obligation to the earth, and again, even what we call art. Norval Morisot's work is part of shifting all of these narratives. Morisot's work brings me so much hope, but we have far to go. I am still new to East End United. I haven't even been here a whole three weeks yet. But something you will hear me say over and over again is that salvation is not an individual endeavor. Salvation, which I understand less as being saved and more like being reconciled, this is something that ultimately happens within community. My fate is inextricably tied to the well-being of my neighbor. Their fate is my fate. And if this is my understanding, then anything I might do to fight for the rights and position of my neighbor, that is not simply some altruistic gesture. It is my soul and my wholeness on the line as well. I know not everybody listening identifies as a settler. Some of us have arrived to Canada within our lifetime. Some of us are descended from people who were brought here against their will. Each of us has our own unique relationship to what truth and reconciliation in this time and place means. However, those of us who gather to worship in a united church, we have a particular legacy to wrestle with. The United Church of Canada is a denomination formed out of an act of parliament. We are as close to a state church as one can have in this country. We operated 15 residential schools on behalf of the Canadian government. We are a predominantly settler church, even though we are trying to work on that. But this is a history we are forced to wrestle with. And in that wrestling, it makes sense that we would cry and cry and cry. But as the words of the prophets remind us, it doesn't need to always be like this. We have not been set up for something that is impossible. Reconciliation will take time. Wisdom shared by elders says it took seven generations for us to get here, and it will take at least seven generations to get out. But we are already seeing glimpses. Yes, there needs to be clean drinking water in every single community. And yes, treaties need to be honored. And for the love of the sweet baby Jesus, search the landfill already. But there are also these glimpses of hope. In gifts of beautiful art. In the returning of lands that were taken in the times when governments and colonial forces can butt out and understand that indigenous communities know what is needed for their own people to thrive, in the moments when my non-indigenous family makes a pilgrimage and is welcomed with a hospitality that moves me deeply. And it makes me hope, not in a passive or wishful sense, but a hope that requires work and resolve. A challenging hope found within oracles that one day, one day when we cry and cry and cry, those tears will come from a place deep in our core that can sense this. This is finally as it should be. I pray from the deepest place I can pray that this will one day be so. Amen.
and let her put on it on. Always, always, where will you go as time goes on? You go with every soul, every young man here and before. Your scars are deep within you, never know they form a soul. Your scars are deeper than. Let go, let go, let go, let go. I lift my eyes up to the hills. This my morning song, where my strength comes from. I lift my eyes up to the hills. This my evening song, where my help comes from. This is the gravity love, just as the moon follows the sun. You're all around me. You're holding everything. This is the hope of every land, just as the universe expands. Your love is reaching. You're holding everything. Up to the hills. When will I help? Go? No, we cry. How long? We lift our eyes up to the hills. Even as we run, hope is chasing us. This is the gravity alone. Just as the moon. Follows the sun, you're all around me. You're holding everything. This is the hope of every land. Just as the universe expands, your love is reaching. You're holding everything.
There was a lot more I wanted to say in this week's message. There is, of course, so much that can be said. However, if you are looking for more information about Morisot's art and about the devaluing of the work of Indigenous artists such as Morisot, I have linked a number of articles into our show notes, which you can find within any app you are listening to this podcast from. You will also find their links to a video about Bingwi Niashi Anishinaabek First Nation and their efforts to rebuild the community. And also, you can find the text to an oracle concerning Canada in the show notes as well. Thank you for listening, and we will be back next week. East End United Regional Ministry as an affirming congregation of the United Church of Canada in Toronto. To learn more about us, connect with our worship services, and learn about our many outreach and justice initiatives, please visit our website at www.eastendunited.ca.